joining. Otherwise, we're going to have everybody move up front. Yeah. You can't have front empty chairs. OK, I would suggest uh, we start. OK. Um, <coughs> first of all, Naveen, thank you for uh, joining for this uh, Monday morning uh, meeting of the Breakfast Club. Thank you. Thank you, Sasha. And uh, these are some of our friends and members. And we organize um, once monthly uh, such a meeting uh, to talk about uh, um, how we can support uh, female entrepreneurship, uh, leadership, and uh, also on topics that are um, female friendly. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, the good thing is that, uh, of course, uh, we have men and women uh, uh, in Bulgaria and that are working actively on expanding the film female entrepreneurship. And I know you are also doing this on a worldwide basis. For our friends, uh, I just want to say a few words on uh, who you are, why Monday morning when everybody's planning the week, uh, uh, we decided to make this, uh, uh, this meeting. Davin Jane uh, is a serial entrepreneur. He's coming from uh, California, from the Bay Area, and uh, is uh, the founder of uh, Moon Express, one of the seven, eight companies that he has founded in the last 20 years. And uh, Moon Express uh, is the uh, only uh, company that uh, got uh, permission from the US government uh, to land on the moon and to harvest the resources uh, that um, uh, are available in support of the, uh, of the needs that we here on the Earth have. Uh, but um, I, uh, he has also lots of philanthropic um, engagements. Uh, he's um, trustee on the board of uh, the Foundation X Prize. And uh, X Price uh, is uh, engaged and involved and support uh, a series of initiatives uh, on how, via innovation, we to solve challenges uh, uh, that are before the humanity. So, Naveen, we are very happy uh, to have you this morning here. Uh, actually, this is the last event uh, from the series of initiatives around DigiTalk. Naveen was one of the uh, <coughs> speakers at DigiTalk. And I uh, don't want to forget uh, to also outline our partners for this uh, morning, uh, the female-led uh, legal company uh, that uh, is supporting uh, this breakfast this morning. So here are uh, Mrs. Uh, um, Icheva, uh, Vucheva, sorry, uh, Vucheva and Ilieva that are the co-founders of the uh, legal company. Uh, so they work a lot with uh, startup support, with IP rights. So if you have specific needs here um, after the formal part, you can meet them or via us uh, in the next days. So. Uh, yes. Naveen, <coughs> yes. tell us why, uh, why on the moon did mm -hmm. you uh, exploit already in a smart way uh, all possibilities that the Mother Earth uh, gives us? Sure. So look at, uh, you know, so everything that you do in life, you have to say, what is my purpose? Why am I doing it? So anytime you start something, any company, any mission, you start yourself with the first question. God forbid, if I'm actually successful in doing what I'm doing, how would the world be a different place? What is it that I'm trying to do that will make something that is meaningful, significant, and will make a society a better society? And you know, a lot of people look at that way and say, oh, so that's really an NGO or a non-profit. Answer is no. 
only way you can do a large good in the world is to create a profitable company. Even if you are the richest man in the world, you're going to run out of money sooner or later by doing a small good if you can't make profit. So profit is the engine that allows you to do great things in humanity. So if you ever want to help billion people or two billion people or five billion people, the only way you can do that is to create a company that solves a big problem and it's very profitable because that is what allows you to go from 100 people to 1,000 people to million people to 100 million people to billion people, right? And that's the only way you can do a large good in the world. Now, coming back to why go to the moon. Uh, the purpose really is, the ultimate purpose is to save the humanity from extinction. So think about it. We all are living on a spacecraft and we call this a spacecraft lovingly as planet Earth. The planet Earth is a spacecraft that's flying in the space and it's only a matter of time that we're going to get hit by something, a large object in the space. And if that were to happen, imagine we will all be the dinosaurs. And I'm not sure that we understand the dinosaur language quite well, but if you could hear a dinosaurs rolling in their graves, they all will be saying one single thing. They wish they had one good entrepreneurial dinosaur. They'll still be roaming on the moon and the Mars, right? But there was nobody that could save them, right? So the last thing we want is to become the dinosaur as humanity. And that is really the purpose of going to the moon. <clears throat> but if I were looking at it from a business perspective, the business perspective is really clear. Uh, we all heard the John F. Kennedy speech when, we, when he said we want to go to the moon. And here, if I were to rephrase John F. Kennedy in today's terms, this is how it's going to sound like. We chose to go to the moon not because it's easy, because it's a good business, right? <laughs> and good business is why entrepreneurs do things, right? So what makes it a good business? So number of things. First of all, moon has been collecting the asteroidal riches for the last four billion years. So everything we mine on Earth, we are actually mining the early days of the asteroids that hit the planet Earth and really created the platinum or gold and everything else that we value here on Earth is really the asteroidal riches. We can see with the naked eyes all the craters on the moon. These are really the asteroids coming and depositing all the riches. <clears throat> the estimates are about 16 quadrillion dollar worth of minerals on the moon. 16 quadrillion. Two weeks ago, NASA in fact just identified one single asteroid that's worth 10,000 quadrillion. I am no mathematician, but that's a shitload of money. Uh, but the idea is all these asteroidal riches are there. So, you know, you could obviously bring back the platinum, the rare earth elements, or even the helium-3. So helium-3 is an isotope of helium that is the best clean energy resource humanity has ever known. For fusion energy, the helium-3 is best. A small quantity of helium-3 would power this planet for generations to come. So to me, that's a great benefit that we can create a clean fusion energy. Now, somebody who is really smart would have said, this guy doesn't even know there is no fusion reactors right now. And he's going and thinking about fusion energy and bringing the fuel for something that doesn't exist. And that is really the key for entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurs don't look at what is or where the puck is. They look at where the puck is going to be and what the world is going to be. So if you build a company based on what exists today, then you'll always be behind by the time you're ready. It's going to take us 7, 10 years to harvest the you know, helium-3 and bring it. And by that time, <clears throat> people would have the fusion reactors. And somebody would be saying, holy shit, the fusion works, but does somebody have helium-3? And you say, yep, got <laughs> right. And that is really is the key to success. So this is one of the ways I explain to our children is that when you look at it, the world, Never look at, people talk about, you know, optimist or pessimist. They look at, the, is the glass half empty or half full? And to me, that is the wrong question to ask. The only question entrepreneurs need to ask is, do I want to fill the glass or not? Because if I want to fill the glass, does it really matter whether it's half empty or half full? That is, that means, look at the world, what you want the world to be, not what the world is. <clears throat> what the world is, is immaterial. <clears throat> It's immaterial to what you want the world to be, right? So, 
And the second thing really is, what is it that you want to fill that glass with? And that is another question that only thing you have to ask. Because to some extent, nothing is ever empty. In, when you look at empty that's really filled with air, and all you're saying is, I want to change what it's filled with, with something totally different, right? And that is an entrepreneurial mindset of how you look at the problem. So let me just step back for a few seconds here and, and you know I, I can give you all the reasons why I go to the moon but I want to make this about entrepreneurship and about you not about me and what I do. So I want to give you some of the tips of the things that I have learned as an entrepreneur and I'm hoping that every one of you in this room by the time I'm finished is so excited about life that they're going to go out and do some amazing things. So the best gift I can give you is I'm giving you the thing that's most important to me which is my time and the best gift you can do uh, give me is go out and use that to go create some amazing businesses and if you promise you will do that I will give you my heart and soul and all I ask you in, in return is please go out and do something that is so meaningful that will change the way people live their lives on Facebook right. so <clears throat> what so to me um, I think we as entrepreneurs, there has never been a better time in the history of humanity than today. There, in the next 10 years, it is going to fundamentally change the trajectory of how humanity lives. Every single thing that is out there and you people think is the big company, half of the fortune 500 companies will go out of business in the next 10 years there is a seismic shift that's coming that is the best opportunity the entrepreneurs have and the good thing is <clears throat> the technology is moving at a such a fast pace that every single thing that exists now will become obsolete in the next five to ten years so imagine the seismic uh, opportunities you have so the biggest problems in the world are the best opportunity for an entrepreneur every time you see a problem don't complain about why can't someone do something about it the question you need to ask yourself is what can I do about it what can I do right and every problem is actually is solvable today there is no problem in the world that you can't solve through innovation and entrepreneurship and I'm going to give you lots of examples of how you do that but I can tell you that it is the most amazing time and the reason I find it's the most amazing time is when the king is going to die you know the king is on the deathbed everybody has a chance a fair chance to become the market leader the new king the king is dying I don't care what industry you are in that industry is going to be decimated and it's going to be decimated in front of our eyes many many times so if you miss the first opportunity the second bus is right around the corner don't ever worry about my god somebody already started the company now what well guess what that means they're closer to being obsolete than you are right and that's all it is really every company so here's my prediction uber is going to go under before they do an IPO and here is why the fundamentally there is a seismic shift happened what they did to everyone else was aggregated all the drivers and that was their strength when you have self-driving cars you know who is the driver the manufacturer of the car right they are the new driver and they have already aggregated them all they call manufacturing right that means Tesla can become an Uber overnight. Everybody has a Tesla app already. Everybody, they already have a driver and they can automatically now create a marketplace. GM can do the same thing. The Ford can do the same thing. They can all, three manufacturers can come together and boom, there you have the largest network of drivers that has ever been done. And that's just one example. That single technology will change a lot of different industries and I can give you examples after examples that how a single technology can change 10 industries and then I'm going to tell you a 10 technologies and you can see what happens next right so let's just stick with the self-driving car for 30 seconds now the self-driving car exists not only is going to change uh, automobile industry because you no longer have to manufacture uh, it, it, people don't have to buy the cars anymore because now they can order whatever car they want when they want so one day they want going long distance they can have a, a electric vehicle and when they really want to impress their girlfriend they can order a Ferrari 
and but every car is available to you on demand that means every car you want is available to you whenever you want so you no longer have to own something because it's always there for you now imagine what happens next since these cars are constantly communicating with each other they can drive much closer to each other that means you don't need to build as many roads so what happens to the construction companies like caterpillar the cars don't have to park in the next building underneath where you work because they come wherever you are that means what happens to all the parking lots which are in the prime spot in the center of the city they can all become affordable housing right now imagine with that technology if the cars are not getting into accident because it automatically stops what happens to the automobile insurance what happens to the life insurance what if people uh, can live much longer because they're not dying in accident and I'll tell you more about the revolution in the healthcare that will allow you to live for a long time with uh, uh, no sickness and I'm going to come back and tell you what I'm doing about that <laughs> but continue going people no longer have to stay in the city where they work because your car can become your office it's holographically you're always connected and then what happens to the real estate industry and that's just one technology now imagine I can tell you what's going to happen in nanotechnology with neuroscience or artificial intelligence the world is going to be a very different place than we know and the interesting thing is any time when the technology is on the exponential curve and the things that used to be physical once they become digitized you know what happens it becomes democratized and it becomes demonetized that means it becomes free so imagine every single thing that we value whether it is energy we pay for it today food right water everything that we pay for today what if we could create abundance of them and they become the next oxygen why do I say the next oxygen the beauty is everybody believes it doesn't matter how much we have or what we have the humans will always fight over it and I keep reminding them that is just not true how many of us are sitting in this room are not fighting over oxygen nobody is saying hey move away you're taking my oxygen this is my oxygen you're coming into my right people say you can have oxygen I can have it because we believe it's in abundance now imagine if the energy wasn't so abundant that it was free and like oxygen what if food was in abundance what if water was in abundance what if land was in abundance what if everything that we value becomes so abundant that it becomes free right. and the interesting thing is it is so close you can feel it you can touch it so for example let me tell you about another venture that I have I just started It's in the healthcare and what we're doing is imagine living in a world where illness is a matter of choice not a matter of bad luck that means you get to decide I want to be sick not because you will get sick mm -hmm. and you say how can that be possible don't the genes matter don't the thi other things matter and the answer is absolutely not and here's very interesting thing you'll find I'm gonna give you two more examples and I'm gonna allow Sasha to at least ask me a second question because normally what happens is <laughs> Um, I am just hard person to be moderated <laughs> uh, <clears throat> uh, so let me just continue down that thought process of what is going on one of the things that stops entrepreneurs from doing something is they say well I know nothing about it how can I go out and start a healthcare company I know nothing about healthcare interesting thing is the less you know the better the chances you are you'll be able to disrupt that industry if you are an expert in an industry, you can only improve it incrementally. You will say, oh, this is how we do it. I have a great idea. You can improve it 10% or 15%. You will never be able to change it 10 times or 100 times unless you are a non-expert. I have started seven companies and never been the two companies in the same industry. And here's, very, here's the beauty of it. I, my first company was in the smartphone I'm gonna come back and I'll tell you more about it someday they no have no background in computer science I don't even have a management degree I fundamentally believe that the less I knew the better off I was I was to challenge the foundation of everything that people have taken for granted when I started the uh, space exploration company my first question was how do you go to some place that keeps moving every time I look at it, it's moved already how am I gonna get there <laughs> right and in a point was I was that dumb 
And now, by in the next six months, we'll become the first company ever to land on the moon. Or in fact, first company to ever leave Earth orbit. You may think about that, didn't Elon Musk and Richard Branson and Jeff Bezos all going to the space? When they talk about space, they talk about low Earth orbit. Unambitious, <laughs> underachievers. <laughs> Right? Leaving the Earth orbit and landing on a celestial body, that is ambition. <laughs> right? So anyway, coming back to it, what I mean is that when we started the company, at that time, the first time when we landed on the moon, by the way, the cost was $25 billion. In today's dollar terms, it would be $100 billion. When we started the company seven years ago, we were convinced at that time the cost was approximately a billion or so. I was convinced that technology is moving so fast, we'll be able to bring the cost down to $100 million. And I was so wrong. I was absolutely wrong. Turned out the cost was under $10 million. The technology move was, I thought we'll be able to get 10-fold advantage. I didn't realize that technology is moving so fast, we got 100-fold advantage. Right? And that is the beauty of the thing is that you may think you are being really optimistic and you really understand technology, but God, the human brain just does not understand the exponential technology. The human brain just can't fathom how fast things are falling. Right? Do you guys remember owning a camera? You guys are young enough to remember that. <laughs> right? you, people used to buy cameras. You know what happened to that? It's free. It's on your phone. In fact, it's better than the most cameras I ever owned. Right? And that is happening to every industry. That thing had GPS. We used to buy GPS. That people used to buy accelerometer. People, all the technology you see on the smartphone today, here's the thing you may not realize. That smartphone that the lady is taking a picture from has more processing power than the supercomputer that landed the man on the moon. It has more, super, more power, processing power than the Cray in the 60s. Think about that for a second here. That, and that's how the world is changing. Right? So in the healthcare, the thing that really, really surprised me most, and I'm assuming you, know, you are very interested in healthcare, is, is I've never seen something that is going to be an industry that is going to be completely decimated. It, the healthcare, as we know, is going to completely go away. And here's why. Today, we don't have a healthcare system. We don't even have a disease care system. All we have is a symptom care system. When you go to a doctor and say, doctor, I have a headache. He doesn't care why you have a headache. He gives you an aspirin. It says, you just won't feel the pain. It doesn't mean I've solved anything. It's just you don't feel it anymore. And that's all they do. Doc, I got an autoimmune disease. Let me suppress your immune system. Doc, immune system exists because body needs it. You can't suppress it. <laughs> Point is, you go on and on. And I can tell you all they do is suppress the symptom. So here is a very interesting thing I learned about life, that generally any system, when they start, they start with a purpose, and they really have a noble cause. Organization like this or any other uh, things that people start have a noble purpose and people want to do the right thing. Over time, that system becomes like any other organism. And the Darwinian theory takes over. That means survival of the system becomes the only goal. And the purpose is either not valid anymore. Either the purpose goes away. Or purpose always is there. The problem is still there. You become irrelevant to that cause. Think for some second. When you start something, you become irrelevant to what the, things, the problem. Not the problem becomes irrelevant. You just become irrelevant. And that's happening in the healthcare. So healthcare system is nothing wrong with it. It was designed for a different era, just like our education system. So let me give you a, a story of what happened. As I was getting closer and closer to launching on the moon, I said, now that I have taken the moon shot, what will be my next moon shot? And I wanted to find out what my new, next moon shot was. And I settled whether I'm going to fix education or I'm going to fix healthcare. And I looked at both of them. It turns out they are identical problems. What makes them identical? Everybody knows that, that both of them are not working. Everybody believes that both of them are broken. And it turns out neither one of them is broken. 
they're doing exactly what they were designed to do. What has changed is our needs have changed. What we want out of the system is very different than what the system was designed for. So for example, education system, it was designed for you to learn certain skills and you could use that skill for the rest of your life because things weren't changing. And that skill was valid and you could use that for the rest of your life and life was wonderful. What happened when the exponential technologies came out is that suddenly every skill, it didn't matter what skill you had, became obsolete every five to ten years. And what you have is a chronic unemployment. You have to be retrained all the time. The skill is no longer needed. Whether you are a driver, whether you are a person in the manufacturing, and you can go on and on. Lawyers will not be needed in the future. Accountants will not be needed in the future. All of, the, all of those things are going to completely disappear because there is no reason for them to exist because human mind is just not good enough to process them. Right? All those things will just completely disappear. <laughs> now, what is going to happen is, so that is what happened in education system. So what does the new education <coughs> system needs to do? It needs to completely move away from teaching you information and a skill. Instead, it needs to teach you learning to learn, how to work in the group, how, you know, and constantly learning to solve the problem using interdisciplinary approach. And if you are interested in education, I've written a couple of articles that you will find really fascinating. So just Google Naveen Jain Forbes Education and the two articles, Why Education is Ripe for Disruption and Why How to Design the Next Century's Education System. Um, and by the way, if one of you can fix that problem before I get onto it, after I fix my healthcare, if you haven't fixed it, you know that's going to be my next problem to fix. So if you fix it, I'll go on to the agriculture. But if not, I, education is I'm hitting next. <laughs> so healthcare, coming back to healthcare, same problem ha happened. In 20th century, when we were designing the healthcare system, we were dying from infectious diseases. So we created a system. When you were sick, you went to the doctor. Doctor gave you the medicine, and life was wonderful. It was episodic. What do we have now? The chronic diseases. You know what the chronic diseases means? You're always sick. Mm -hmm. That means now the system that was designed for episodic thing is suddenly dealing with the things when you're always sick. It doesn't work. Here is the worst part. The irony is the solution for the infectious diseases is what caused the chronic diseases. Mm -hmm. it, we solve the infectious diseases by giving you antibiotics. And that is what caused the chronic diseases. So here, let me give you some learning about how it is. 50 years ago, we believed the best human body is the body that's completely devoid. If we can eliminate all the bacteria and all the viruses from our body, we will be the best, best run human body. What we did not know was we are actually a climate and the ecosystem within ourselves. And here are the, some of the things that I learned that I think you hopefully will find just as fascinating. I always thought <coughs> that we are a product of our genes. Our DNA makes us who we are. Now, imagine if I told you that less than 1% of the genes that are expressed in our body comes from our DNA. Less than 1%. Our DNA only produces 20,000 genes. The microorganisms that live inside us, they produce 10 million genes. They are the puppet masters. We are the puppet. And here is what's very interesting. We are simply, we may be so proud of ourselves of who we are, we are simply a beautiful container for these microorganisms. So just sometime when you really start to feel really arrogant, just remember you're a container. <laughs> That's who we really are. And what's interesting is, in the last five years, we've learned every single chronic disease. By the way, how many of you know the Parkinson's is not a disease that starts in the brain, it starts in your gut. Alzheimer's starts in the gut. Depression doesn't happen here, depression happens here. Did you know that 70% of serotonin is produced in your gut? Guess what happens? When you are depressed, what do you do? You eat. That is what produces, I'm not kidding you, 70% of serotonin is produced in your gut. In fact, two days ago, if you Google, there is an article that came out. Not only the cancer is caused by the microorganism, the cure for cancer, whether it works or does not work, depends on your microorganism. They can predict whether chemotherapy or immunotherapy is going to work or not work, not based on your genes, but based on your microbiome. They actually decide what happens in the body. 
They, pro they provide all the nutrients. So obesity, mm. allergies, eczema, everything that all the chronic diseases are fundamentally the inflammation diseases. You know what, I'm not talking as if I even know what I'm talking about. And here's the interesting thing, when I started the company six months ago, I know, knew nothing about healthcare. I have no, no background in healthcare. And I started this company six months ago based on a technology that government labs have developed for killing people. It was a biodefense work. It was done for the biological uh, weapons and defense of the biological weapons to figure out how do we, if we knew how body worked, we could kill people easily. And if somebody else had a biological weapon, we needed to find out how we got infected and what's happening inside the body. So they developed this technology. Now, my connecting the dots for when I saw this, I'm thinking, if I know what's making people sick and what makes people sick, why can't I just use that to keep people healthy? And I licensed the technology from them. And your beauty the thing is, it costs you zero. And every one of the entrepreneurs, by the way, you should go look at every single national university, national lab, by law and by right, you have a right to see what they're doing and to be able to license it. So go out there and see what's out there and use it to create a company. So here's very interesting, in six months, not only I started the company, I launched the product to public and I completely bypassed the healthcare system. The, the minute you go through the system, the system swallows you. It's like an immune system of the system attacks you and it wants to kill you. The T cells to the healthcare system will kill you because it doesn't like being ch challenged. And the best thing you do is like any innovation, you go around the system. The best innovation. Have, how many of you guys read The Innovator's Dilemma by Clayton Christensen? You will know. You will never be able to succeed when you hit the problem head on. The system will swallow you. The immune, system, immune cells will kill you. So what you do is, you don't threaten them. And the way you don't threaten them, you go around them. So if you are education system, don't say, I want to go take it to the public university, the public uh, school, you will get killed. What you do is and say, public education system is awesome, leave it alone. Let me go the children home school. They need something, so I'm going to build the education system that the kids in the home schooling are using it. The kids who really want to do better in the SAT score and the get better grades, they can use it at home. I'm bypassing the system set at home now. Then I'm going to go to only the rich people who go to private schools. Then I'm going to go to, and by this time you have so much proof point and the AI has gotten so much better. The immune system has no way because it's been invaded now. And you surround it, the immune system by so much of the uh, things around it, the immune system dies. And the, remember, death cures every disease. <laughs> so kill the system. Every time I look at the system and say, kill the system. And you go out and you start again. Right? So this system is going to get killed. <laughs> <laughs> you, she had, she's itching to ask me a second question. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was thinking uh, on, on the, in a way on the topic that yeah. we meet uh, yeah. here. The women is empowerment. Is the women invasion that will kill the <laughs> yes. men's club uh, in the business and uh, you are very smart to be on the female friendly uh, breakfast here uh, to reserve uh, space for the next uh, generation of uh, business environment and leadership. So here's the interesting thing, and I know Sasha is going to kill me. The <laughs> more you try to believe you are different and disadvantaged, the more you're going to continue to be different and disadvantaged. Right? No, that's that, right. that's so I share fully. Uh, no, 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 my point you can say somehow somebody else, somebody else need to empower you. Women empowerment happens when we empower ourselves. So I want to call it a human empowerment because it's the same thing whether you are a man or you are a woman. It is empowering yourself, believing everything is possible. The mindset is what stops you from doing. If you believe something is impossible, it becomes impossible for you, not for someone else. In fact, when more people come and tell me what you're doing is just not going to work, 
all that means is every one of them have taken themselves out of the competition and the basically ball is mine to move forward now right so the more people believe it's not possible the better for you to move the ball forward because nobody's coming in your way right so idea is the way you empower yourself is to believe what can be done and the difference you have is the best advantage you have don't be like man don't behave like men don't yeah. talk like men don't be a man you cannot beat a man in being a man there will always be a better man than men. <laughs> right be the, be the best woman you can and I tell you for me it's the same problem I am an immigrant I grew up in India we were so poor, we had no food to eat, we had no place to stay, we moved from village to village, everywhere. There were places where we did our schooling, there were no tables, no chairs. We sat on the floor, we wrote on the floor, and that was our education system. My sister went on to become a postdoctorate in applied mathematics. My brother had a PhD in computer science and statistics. I was the least educated person in my family within engineering and MBA. Uh, and I engineering was industrial engineering that did not do much good for me because at that time in India everybody thought that you know really the best way was to get into manufacturing system so I did industrial engineering and my MBA was in union management and now how, see what I do <laughs> right so now my job is to kill everything that I see around me right? uh, so point was I came to United States with five dollars in my pocket and didn't speak the language God has been very kind to us I was different I am different. I don't speak like American. I don't dress like American. I don't talk like them. And here's what I learned. Amazing things happened. If I was one of them, they could tune me out half the time and they could still understand what I was saying. Being with a, such a thick accent, you're not paying 100% attention to me. You don't understand a word what I'm saying. <laughs> and that was the beauty of it. When I was in the room, I got 100% of everyone's attention. You couldn't give me 90% and understand what I'm saying. <laughs> But my point is that is the thing. I told people, if you want to be like them, you'll always be at the like them at the bottom. The average people at the top of the pyramid. The person at the top is a different person. Be different. Don't be like them. Don't think you have to be like everyone else to be to be successful. No. The more different you are, the more different you think, more different you look. Every one of the things that makes you a great person, I didn't say great woman, a great person is your best advantage. Don't be like someone else. I still remember I was at an event of doctors and I said simply a statement and say most doctors are average. Now they were so huffy and puffy say can you tell us the source of your information and it's called <laughs> mathematics. I say, ah, they got, I mean, mathematics tells you the average is most people, right? And to them, they're offensive that I would call the most people are average because we see what the math is, right? My point is, people want to be like everyone else rather than being different. So the best woman empowerment is the same advice I will give you that I gave my daughter. I have, by the way, three children, and the most, the biggest accomplishments from my life has been our children and I'm going to how many of you are parents in this room very few so I'm not going to give you parental advice there uh, but his very interesting thing parenting is the most counterintuitive thing you will ever see uh, every single thing that you think you're doing it for the good of the children is actually is really bad for them right so when you do those things because out of a um, majority of the parents who are successful do things out of guilt. Out of guilt, I want to spend time with my family. That is a guilt feeling because somehow they feel it makes them a, sh a bad parent if they're not spending time with the family. When your da daughter or son comes to you and say they have a passion, what's your first inclination? Oh my God, I want to help you pursue your passion, you have a passion. <laughs> That same as saying, I don't give a shit about you, just go do what you want. What is the true parent's job? Is to expose them to as many ideas as possible before they find their passion. Yes. And that is not something most parents do. Here's what happened when my daughter was 16 year old. She came to me and this is a true story. She said, Dad, I know you love science and technology. I have found my true passion. That's what I'm going to pursue. I want nothing to do with science and technology, so just get used to it. 
And I could have said, oh my God, you have a passion, let me help you. I didn't. And I said, I call her my doll. I said, doll, you're not letting me do my job, parent, your father's job. What's dad's job? Dad's job is really simple, to expose you to enough ideas so you can find what is out there before you say what your passion is. What would you like me to do? I said, doll, I want you to go to Singularity University. I want you to learn about nanotechnology. I want you to learn about neuroscience. I want you to learn about genetics. I want you to learn about artificial intelligence. And you know what she did? She rolled her eyes. And that is an article I want you to read. It's an Inc. magazine I wrote. Uh, wrote. It's called An Entrepreneur Versus His Eye-Rolling Teenage Daughter. <laughs> and the story ends well. So she said, Dad, I, you, know, you don't even hear a word I'm saying to you. I want nothing to do with this. And I said, sweetie, here's what we should do. You give me your word that you're going to go there for four weeks with an open mind, wanting to learn and wanting to like. And if you give me your promise that you're going to go there, and with absolute open mind, I'll give you a promise. When you come back, you get to decide what you want because now I have done my part of exposing you to everything. <laughs> she goes there for four weeks. She said, Dad, if you make me a promise, I'll go there. She comes back, opens the door, and the first word she said was, Dad, now I have made up my mind. And my, my words were really simple. Oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> I said, sweetie, I gave you my word, so tell me what would you like to do. And she said, Dad, I want to be either a neuroscientist or genetist. <laughs> I took a nice deep breath and I said, at the risk of you changing your mind, would you tell me what happened? She said, Dad, you are so dumb. <clears throat> you don't understand. I'm in high school. When I go to my science classes and I say, we mix these chemicals and color changes or I do these things, I don't care because it didn't matter to me. How would I use what I'm doing? When I went to Singularity University, I realized the science and technology is not the destination. It's simply the tools for me to do what I really care about. I wanted to improve the girl's education. I want to improve the girl's health. And what was I thinking if I don't even know how the brain works, how am I going to change education? If I don't even understand how the genetics works of the people, how am I going to change their health? Mm -hmm. So I realized what I needed to learn is this thing so I can go out and pursue. And that is the beauty of the thing is. Science and technology are simply the tools in your tool chest for you to go use them. If you only have a hammer, every problem looks like a nail. But if you have a wrench, you have a screwdriver, you can say, oh, that problem is a screwdriver problem, that problem is a wrench problem, that problem is a hammer problem. You don't are stuck with a one single screw. And that is what the exposure does to you. So understanding, so here's what I do. The reason I'm able to start so many different companies in different industries is I read a lot. Honestly, so I work, first of all, 18 hour days, seven days a week. There's never been a day that I have taken off. Here's the best part. I get up at about 4.30 in the morning and I spend the first two and a half hours reading the news about science. So I, my Twitter feed is every science magazine, every article. I don't need to know the details of amyloid beta, what it does. I just need to know there are research that is pointing that Alzheimer is a really inflammatory disease. And now, by the way, if you are curious about any uh, Alzheimer, it turns out they found the microorganism in the where people who have Alzheimer in their brain, and that microorganism is really the inflammation, what causes the inflammation. So glial cells in the brain are essentially our immune systems of the brain, and they start to clamp to kill the same uh, things and it gets overwhelmed and it starts killing neurons. So it's an inflammatory disease that actually starts in the gut, leaky gut, inflammation, microorganisms from the gut going into the uh, blood and that's how it goes uh, through the blood-brain barrier. And in fact, the vagal, if you know the gut-brain connection, every time you have anxiety, you see the butterfly in the stomach. You don't see the butterfly in your head. <laughs> I mean, that, so it's amazing. So when your mother says, listen to your gut, she was the best doctor you could have ever found. The gut is the key. <laughs> Coming back to is that as an entrepreneur, you are always looking at the problem and saying what technologies is at my disposal to solve that. And the amazing thing is everything is not possible. And at a price point that it doesn't take a lot to do something. The reason I love being an entrepreneur to start a company, you don't need millions of dollars to prove something that you're trying to do. 
tens of thousands of dollars or even thousands of dollars is all it takes to prove the point that what you're trying to do will actually work. You have on-demand Amazon service. You don't have to buy a computer. You put that thing on Amazon service and most of the time it's such little amount and once you build something, a quick prototype, you can spend $50 on a Google AdWords to drive some traffic to see what people think of it. And spending less than $1,000, you can show what you're trying to do. People want it. You have customers who said they want it. And you suddenly can do a prototype and proofing so easily that would have cost in the olden days in my times million dollars because you have to buy the data center. You have to buy computers. You have to put them together. All the things you don't need anymore. Right? And the processing, you could even write the damn code on your iPhone if you had to. I mean, things are becoming so easier to do. And people around the world are at your disposal. So here's what I believe. I believe the entrepreneurs are going to be the next superpowers. Nation states and the countries and the governments are going to become completely irrelevant. And here's why they're going to become irrelevant. The problems that was used to be the domain of the country, the nation states, are now being solved by entrepreneurs. What did, the, what did you expect the government to do? Healthcare, education, defense, space, security. Who is doing them now? The, all those problems are not going to be solved in my country by Obamacare or Trump care. It is someone like me who says, I'm sick and tired of this damn system and I'm going to go out and fix it or kill it. Right? And that's how the entrepreneurs do. So when entrepreneurs become, so think about it. When we land on the moon, not only we become the first company, think about it. We become the fourth superpower. Only three superpowers have ever landed on any, any celestial body. And we become the fourth superpower. And the fourth superpower is not Germany, France, UK, Belgium, Bulgaria. It is a small group of 25 people. They say, because we can do this. When we fix the healthcare problem, it won't be people arguing about should we do this or not. What to do when people are sick? We say, let's just prevent the disease. What if nobody is sick? I mean, think about what happened in healthcare today. So, I mean, it just boggles my mind. Doctors have no incentive to keep you healthy because their children can't be fed if you're not sick. Who's going to pay the money? <laughs> Pharmaceutical companies love chronic diseases. They hate infectious diseases. You take antibiotics and you're done. Chronic diseases they love for the rest of your life. You are paying them a subscription fee. They don't want you to be cured because you stop paying. They don't want you to die because your credit card stops working. They hate that. <laughs> They just want you to live in misery for the rest of your life. They love that thing, right? It is the mind-boggling of everybody. There's nobody who cares about you. The insurance company has no incentive to keep you healthy because the more premium you pay, the more money they make. I mean, nobody in the system. And this is interesting. <laughs> I went to one of the events called Future of Health. That was before I started this company. And there were CEOs from pharmaceutical company, the diagnostic company, and everyone. And they wrote on the board the stakeholders in the st uh, healthcare system. It was doctors, hospital, insurance company, regulatory bodies. After 15 minutes of listening to the bullshit, I said, what about that stakeholder? What stakeholder are you concerned with? The patient. You know what they told me? The patient is not a stakeholder. <laughs> Why so? They told me the patient does not pay. We don't need to worry about the patient. <laughs> insurance company pays. We don't need to worry about patient. We don't care what patient wants or what's happening to the patient. We need to worry about what the hospital wants to do, what the insurance company wants to do. <coughs> so imagine a system that has become the organism that doesn't even care about the purpose anymore of this patient. So what do we do? We say, let's go to the patient directly. Let's go to the people directly. Because when you are sick, there is no one who cares more about you than you. When you have a chronic disease, I'm not kidding you. If you are smart, you become the expert. You, you research everything. You talk to everyone who has a disease. You try everything. You know every research out there. And by the time you walk into the doctor's office, and the doctor, he's writing a prescription already. He, he's not even listening. <laughs> he's already writing a prescription for you. right? Because the last pretty girl who walked into the office is, doctor, you're not writing enough Lipitor. person who walks in is getting a Lipitor. <laughs> right? My point is, they really have no incentive to cure you or he healthy. So all I'm trying to say is as an entrepreneur, take charge, make things happen. 
There is nothing that you can't do. The only things you can do is the things you believe you can do. If you know nothing about it, it should not discourage you. If you don't have a team, the team will come to you. So the thing that I found most fascinating is, I've had the same team for a long time and I worked with them in my last company. I worked with them for 20 years and there were eight of us. And I said, finally, I said, guys, if I have not taught you everything you can learn about entrepreneurship, you will never learn. Just go away and start your own company. And every one of them did. And every one of them got funding. I had to start with a completely new people. And I'm starting in a completely new industry that I know nothing about it. You know what I did? It's amazing things happen. When you put up that audacious goal in front of the people, that becomes the magnet for the best talent in the world. I said, I'm going to start a company that's going to make illness elective. And we're going to do this by understanding everything that's happening inside the body and applying the artificial intelligence because the human mind cannot understand this much data. And we're going to find what is going on and we're going to just use the diet and nutrition which is what nature does to cure everything. Because diet is the best drug you will ever have. Yeah. Right? No two people can, there is no one thing that's good for anybody. So if someone tells you don't eat carbs or don't eat uh, spinach is good for you or avocado is good for you, they don't have a clue. In fact, what happens is when you look at our gut, our DNA, by the way, so this is interesting fact, 99.5% of our DNA is same between any two people. Me and the tree, 90% of our DNA is same. So I'm no different than tree. When you look at our gut, less than 5% of the microorganisms and what they do is the same. 5%. How can the same diet be good? So I was really been struggling and when I started this company, I've been trying to lose 10 pounds and I've been trying to, my blood glucose was at a pre-diabetic level. And I was told that carbs are so bad for you, you need to stop eating carbs. So I cut down all the carbs, I cut down all the starch, I'm a vegetarian. So only thing I was eating was lentils and legumes and tofu and veggies. And I thought I was a healthy eater. Nothing was changing. I continued, I cut down the portion. I'm now starving myself. And I'm thinking it's still not working. So I, when I launched Wyom, I did the test. My metabolic things and my gut. Turns out my body digests carbohydrates better than it digests protein. I mean, imagine that. And it turns out Growing up in northern part of India, my generations for the 10 generations, you know what they were eating? The wheat, the gluten, the carbs. <laughs> I start eating carbs, I lost two pounds and my blood glucose came down. I mean, that simple, right? Loving the bar, I'm loving this company, I'm telling you. <laughs> eating carbs, starch and loving it, right? My wife, on the other hand, completely different. She needs to eat lentil, legumes and veggies and cut down on the wheat that she's been eating. Right? The so point was no two people are alike, no two. So thing, my body, and by, so we, in our recommendation, I need to minimize avocado and cauliflower. Who would have thought? Spinach, cauliflower and avocado are really good food. Not for me, not today. We, and we test every three months because your body keeps changing. As you change your diet, your body changes. And every three months, we go back and see what's good for you. So my point is that simple thing. So coming back to the story, when I put that goal out there, the head of the Watson research called me and said, I've been working on 20 years and I've been thinking, what could I possibly do that is going to be significant? I've been very successful in life. I never had something that is going to be significant. And this is a significant enough goal for me to quit my job. He was making a million half dollars a year and he quit the job for 100K. Right? The top of the guys, at who, a woman who was working for Craig Venter in Human Longevity, quit her job to join me. The guy the, who was exp expert in the RNA came and joined me because I gave them something meaningful to work on. So what I'm trying to say is when you start a company, have a purpose and a goal that is so audacious, the world's best people will come to you. And by the way, here's the second part. All the finances that you need, the money comes to you. When I put that audacious goal together, the team came together. Then every VC starts calling me. Oh, I heard all these people are working for Wyom. I want to invest in it. So amazing thing that happened. Now everyone is calling on you to be investing. And I kept telling them I don't need the money. 
And the more I told them I don't need the money, the more they're wondering, he must have something really good. <laughs> <laughs> and VCs, if you think they, they are greedy and they love greed, I can tell you one thing they hate the most, fear of missing out. <laughs> yeah, that's true. They miss, I mean, honestly, they are just so afraid. And when you tell a VC what you're doing and they don't fund you, they hate the most and you become successful and they become the poster child of someone they, you came to and you told them, nah, that's not going to work. Every story I'm going to tell and say, you know what? First person I went to was Sasha and Sasha said, healthcare, that'll never work. <laughs> that was her. And she said, holy cow, how was that stupid? <laughs> they hate that, right? So let them know, you're going to be successful with them or without them. And once they know the train is leaving the station, they will get all aboard. <laughs> uh, but Naveen, you are living in the Mecca of entrepreneurship in San Francisco. It is a place where it's very easy. Uh, Such I knew what you're going to ask me and I'm going to answer. I was going to answer that before you asked me that. <laughs> so here's the thing. Now you're going to love the fact. She thinks I'm in Silicon Valley and the money is easy to raise. Now for Moon Express, you know where the money came from? Very little. Less than 5% of the money came from Silicon Valley. Money came from Europe. Money came from China. Money came from Russia. Money came from India. All the places people tell me there is no, no venture capital. Nobody wants to fund anything. Now let me tell you why they don't want to fund anything. And don't take it the wrong way. This problem exists in Bulgaria. So one of the things I'm going to tell you, I have been only been for three days. But I can tell you my impression in three days. I have never met, I met probably I would say a couple of hundred, one of the things I do is I was in uh, Brussels speaking at another event. I, you know, when I come I devote my time to entrepreneurs. I probably did 8, 10 sessions of 50 people each and I met probably several hundred entrepreneurs. The thing I realized is amazing talent that exists yes. here. Mm -hmm. However, every one of the person I talked to has a mindset so small and local. Yeah, and they want to cool. solve a tiny problem because they believe if I go with a big problem, I won't get funded. They build the company for v what VCs want to hear, not what they want to do. Our VCs will never fund that, so let me go build something that VCs want. If VCs were that smart, wouldn't they be starting their own company? Mm -hmm. They are the dumbest people out there, honest to God. They are lemmings. The lemmings follow each other. They will drive each other to ground, but they all follow each other. The reason they don't want to fund you in this country is because they're not seeing the audacious dreams. They're not seeing you being different from everybody else. When you, they are funding, the people here are funding the audacious goals there. And people who are there are not funding the, there, they're funding here. So it's really amazing. Right? So the thing is, do something that they believe, God forbid, if you are actually successful, it could be the mega company. And I just, one of the top VCs in the valley, I had it la last night, long conversation. And I says, imagine if this is the next $100 billion company. And you are arguing with me, should it be worth a quarter billion dollars or half a billion dollars? Does it really matter? Either I'm going to succeed and you know if I succeed it's going to be so massive that you're going to never have to look back or it is going to fail, it doesn't matter what happens, then you're going to lose your money anyway. So what are you arguing me for? Right? And my point was when you create something they can see and the brother, this VC told me, he said look, I know if this what you're doing works, it is going to be a mega company. This is a hundred billion, two hundred billion or massive idea. And that there is no limit. The thing is that even the entrepreneurs, even our, my own mother told me when I was young, he said, son, you're so smart, you can do anything you want. The sky is the limit. You know what that meant? My mother did not tell me the sky doesn't exist. The sky is a figment of our imagination. The sky actually doesn't exist. When you go from here to the moon, you don't pick up a phone and say, mom, I just passed the sky. There is no <laughs> sky. <laughs> The sky is created by our imagination of what we see. It doesn't exist. When someone tells you the sky is the limit, what they're saying is your <coughs> imagination is the limit. If you can't imagine it, you can't get there. So if you want something getting funded, it's not a Silicon Valley. 
come up with a purpose. <coughs> and the two things I would tell you that I think people like, your passion. Find what you're willing to die for and live for it. When you're doing something, they need to hear you in your voice, not in your words. Will you give your last drop of blood before you say, I give up? Entrepreneurs only fail when they give up. Everything else is just a pivot. Right? You keep pivoting. The only time you fail in life is when you say, I give up. And do you think that uh, there is a school for finding a purpose? Yes. How yes. we yeah. grow people that mm -hmm. are really purpose oriented mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. uh, yeah. live for their mm -hmm. big imaginations, not for yeah. small survivor. It's easy, very, very easy. <laughs> so the, I can give you a simple exercise that you can find your true purpose. Uh, imagine if you had everything that you want in your life. You have a billion dollars. You have a wonderful family, you have a great house, and you have multiple houses. What would you do? And if you do that today, you will get everything that you want. You have to go backwards. What is it that you would do if you had everything? And if you say, I'm going to sit on the beach, then you might as well sit on the beach because your life is not going to amount to anything. When you start something for the purpose of making money, you never do it. Making money is like having an orgasm. If you focus on it, you're never going to get it. Just enjoy the process. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I would suggest we make it a little bit more interactive, interactive and um, I want to invite uh, that wasn't a good way people to me. <laughs> that uh, uh, are today, uh, we share please. breakfast today with their questions. Um, hi. Uh, can um, you please yeah. introduce yourself, uh, everybody? Um, I'm Mila. I'm a founder of Plan A, a donations platform for environmental causes. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to hear your opinion on climate change. Because sure. I think, to me, obviously, as I'm working on that, it's the biggest problem we have. And we should be focusing on this, but I guess we can think about other planets as well. But yeah. for the moment, the Earth, yeah. Well, I think you're asking me the <laughs> wrong question. Because what my opinion on climate change is actually doesn't matter. What really matters is, is there a big opportunity here mm -hmm. to do something? And creating a donation platform, is this the best way to solve the problem? If you are an entrepreneur and if you really care about the climate change, you know what the number one thing you should do? Is get people to stop eating meat. That's it. Or one, if you can reduce the amount of beef consumption by one day instead of seven days, just eat six days, you have done more for this planet than any climate change you can do. And the reason is the biggest damage to the environment comes from the cattle. Second thing is, you never want to focus on scarcity. The Europe has this mentality where sustainability has become the synonym for conservation. Sustainability doesn't come from conservation. It's like saying, I want to be rich by not spending. You become rich by making more, not, not by standing. So the thing is the mindset has to change from scarcity to abundance. How do I create more of what we need, not use less of what we have? Instead of worrying about the climate change, why don't you worry about it and say, how do I create the things that will give me a renewable energy source? The cost of renewable energy is continuing to come down. As a matter of fact, the problem I'm seeing uh, with the climate change is most people who are doing it, by the time they get to anything meaningful, the problem will get solved many different ways. because. <coughs> The biggest uh, environmental thing is really the fossil fuel. And it, 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 despite what we like, for no reason, not because people are conscious, because the cost of the renewable energy is going to be lower than the fossil fuel. So if you think about this, uh, focusing on climate change is actually focusing on the symptom, not the root cause. And let me give you one example, and then I'm going to come back if you want more on the climate change in a second. So let's assume uh, you worry about, say, fresh water. And you say fresh water is a problem that uh, humanity faces. And you start to solve the fresh water problem. You will be doing fine until someone tells you that, hey, you know, the fresh water, half the fresh water is used for agriculture. And you say, oh, all I have to do is fix the agriculture. That means I can use aeroponic, 
or aquaponic or even come up with a mechanism where you can use lightly salted water and that will save all the fresh water for humans and all I have to do is solve the agriculture problem. Until you realize the majority of agriculture is used to feed the cattle. And then you say, oh, I got to fix the cattle problem, not the agriculture problem, not the fixed problem. And cattle, and if you do that, essentially all you have to do is take a stem cell from a cow and convert them into muscle tissues. And that will happen. In that case, you can have all the beef in the world you want without having to raise the cattle. And you'll still have the same beef. And that's how you solve the big problems, right? So think about what is the root cause and don't go focus on the symptom of the climate change. Start looking at the things and start seeing how do you enable what causes the climate change. So start thinking about, the, the good thing is, it's simply a technological conversion problem. And here's why. Every 90 minutes, more solar energy fa uh, falls on planet Earth than we use in the whole year. It's simply a conversion problem. And there is a great story that I think would uh, really highlight the problem here. You know about 100 years ago, what was the most precious metal? Anyone? The most precious metal used to be aluminium. Aluminium was the most precious metal that uh, to him 100 years ago. In fact, it was so precious when Napoleon hosted the king of Siam, he wanted to show respect and show how rich he is. So he took all his generals and fed them in the gold platter. All their troops, he fed them in silver platter. And but the king of Siam would nothing else would do except the aluminium platter. And he fed him on the aluminium platter. It is so rare, the top of the monument on the Washington, the National Monument, Washington Monument, the tip is made of aluminium. Because we wanted to show the Britishers how rich we are. <laughs> right? And it was that rare. You know what happened? Bauxite was in plentiful on earth. It was never in the mineable form. It was always mixed. Until the technology called electrolysis came about. And it made aluminium so abundant that we throw it away now. That is what I mean by solar energy. There is so much falling. Today the efficiency is about 22%. People are now working on 32%. People are changing the way the sun moves and able to get variable arrays of the solar side and starting to put nanoparticles in them. So using the nanoparticles and a lot of the uh, computer's uh, algorithms, you will be able to increase the efficiency to 40%. And if you get that, the energy becomes almost free. I mean, it is the cost of the solar panels are coming down so fast that in the next 10 years, not only it will be so cheap at it, uh, at that it almost everybody will have it in their home on the solar thing and it will become basically free. And the storage will come down. So my point is, that problem will get solved. So start thinking about what causes it and starts working on the root cause, not the symptom. I don't know if I answered your question or not. Yeah. Uh, we have also uh, some questions uh, from the next room because there was not enough space for everybody to join. I'll start with the one from Dimitar Karamanchev. Dear Naveen, according to you, what is the core difference in the approach of disrupting uh, healthcare and disrupting education? So I think I spent quite a bit <laughs> yeah, of time, but yeah. maybe not enough. And I think what I would say would be maybe that. Maybe very short uh, the short answer. That, yeah. So in the education, what you need is really a scalable system that does not uh, rely on a physical infrastructure. So think about if there is a small app that can be personalized, it can be adapted, it can be gamified, and it can actually be adapted to how you learn, not how the teacher teaches you. It modifies itself to so how you learn graphically, experimentally, or other things. And if you do the peer-to-peer -peer learning, because everybody can learn from each other, you can even create a mesh network in the places, in the villages where they have no internet. And the mesh network of every peer-to-peer -peer -peer learning of teacher, every teacher and a student becomes the same person. Everybody teaches something to someone. And that could essentially fundamentally disrupt your software. The beauty of that is your marginal cost of delivering education becomes zero. And that is the beauty is that education costs will come down to zero. And this is how you create abundance by starting and demonetizing everything. And that's how you get to billions of people when you can deliver that on every smartphone. Uh, as a matter of fact, I'm at X Prize and there is a global learning prize, a $20 million prize that Elon Musk funded um, that is to take a student a software that can teach illiteracy to complete read, write, and math in 18 months. 
uh, we have a prize that we launched uh, for women's safety, a million dollar prize that uh, I am funding for it's safety.xprize.org for a small sensor that can be anywhere on a woman's body. It could be an mm -hmm. earring, could be anything, and whenever you feel unsafe, you press it, and it automatically notifies your family, it notifies the uh, uh, good Samaritans and the police, and by the way, it starts to do audio video recording. So it's not about he said, she said. It is going to be she said and she had the proof. So we didn't uh, focus too much on she today, but we'll continue. But it's a she. Yeah. No, yeah. again, the reason I don't yeah. want to focus on she is because the problem of she is the problem of he. Yeah, it's a problem. Every yeah. entrepreneur has the same problem. The less you differentiate, the better you are. I'm yeah. happy to talk more in she terms, but I'm telling you that's just not a good thing. That's what... It's uh, like I don't want to call you you people, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Actually, we have next question yeah. uh, from... Hello, thank you very much. You're like a really, really inspiring speaker. Thank you very much for that. You're making us think a little bit bigger. Uh, my name is Anton, and I want to ask you about uh, what are your thoughts on the blockchain yes. and uh, the disruption of the monetary system? Yeah. So two separate things. Uh, uh, blockchain is basically a technology. So let's start to think about a technology is neither good nor bad. It is, can be applied to many different things. What application would you build on top of the uh, blockchain? My fundamental belief is the blockchain would do a lot of things uh, amazing, such as co smart contracts, escrow. All the middlemen that you have, all the middlemen will completely go away. The contracts shouldn't exist. Contracts should be a blockchain that says, you do this, I, I pay you this. As soon as it's satisfied, it automatically releases. So, right. So idea becomes that using the blockchain as a third party trusted entity that is b creating a marketplace between buyers and sellers for every possible thing, whether it's escrow, contracts, or any other thing. Currency is one of the application. My personal belief is currency as a will cryptocurrency will never replace uh, the Fed at uh, the uh, fiat currency for many many reasons. Right now, people get so uh, enamored by Bitcoin. Bitcoin is one of the worst implementation. It can only do three transactions every second. Think about it. So you can, in a credit card, it does multi-million transactions per second. Today, the blockchain they use, the Bitcoin, can only do three transactions a second. It'll never become the thing. Secondly, it is backed by nothing. What you want is a fiat currency. The reason it works is it has power backed by what I would call uh, <coughs> power to tax. Power of taxation is what allows them to know the people will pay back the money or pe the money can be honored. But anyway, point is cryptocurrency as a stored value will, will actually be the best thing that will happen. People store value in cryptocurrency so when they travel in other countries, people will say I, ha I can convert them to local currency. So it becomes more of a stored value rather than currency itself. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> Milena. But ask me about any subject that bothers you. And then we'll what. come to some yeah. of the people from the other room. Yeah, Thanks Milena. so much. Uh, I'm Milena Krumova. I'm an educational entrepreneur and also assistant professor at the Technical University in Sofia. Can you share with us uh, who is your your favorite teacher in your high school and why? Uh, <laughs> now that is a really really tough question, and the reason is. <coughs> My memories of my childhood are extremely uh, poor. I don't remember going to high school. I don't even remember which city I went to high school because we moved every three, six months. So I don't honestly, and this is an honest answer, I don't even remember the name of the high school I went to, forget about the name of the teacher. I don't even know the name of the city I went to high school because we were moving every three, six months. So I don't know where I graduated from and where I studied. But I can tell you the <coughs> biggest influence in my life has been this, the click and the shift that happened the mindset <clears throat> and that really happened which I would highly recommend all of you is to just go to YouTube and watch some of the videos from Singularity University it was fundamentally <coughs> changed the way I think about life and had been the biggest influence on how I think about what is possible and Singularity University is about exponential technologies and what different technologies exist and what they do currently do and what will they be doing in the next five to ten years and that it starts to show you the roadmap of what things are happening and you're able to take different technology to apply to a problem um, and that becomes most meaningful I think this uh, address is one of the uh, questions here uh, coming from Kostadin Kotevsky how did you broaden your horizons and uh, how did you make them uh, from local to global 
uh, what changes uh, your what changed your personal reality I guess uh, some of the entrepreneurs in Bulgaria still think that uh, Bulgaria is uh, a place yeah. where you need to make bigger jump in accordance to land uh, in Silicon Valley and um, do your that story excuses. is pretty much do that excuses I mean those are all the excuses oh I can't do because system doesn't allow me I can't do because people don't want to fund me I can't do because I live in Bulgaria none of that thing really really matters what you're saying is I just can't do because I just don't believe I can and that is the fundamental thing so the reason is <clears throat> the minute you start believing it doesn't matter where you live in fact, living in Bulgaria can be the bad, more, more advantageous than living in Silicon Valley. The talent <coughs> is unbelievable here. You can find a tremendous talent to work on your idea at one-tenth the cost than you would do in the Valley. Well, you can't even hire a good engineer anymore without paying them a, a ransom. <coughs> I mean, it's just crazy. So I think the only reason people don't do it because they don't believe they can, not because they, these are all excuses we build human mind is a great storyteller it builds the narrative based on what you want oh I don't want to do it then you'll come up with 10 reasons why you can so in some sense when you wake up in the morning if you believe you want to be unhappy you can find 10 reasons why you should be unhappy and if you want to be happy you can find 10 reasons why you should be happy and the same thing applies to an entrepreneur it really it's there is nothing, nothing that stops you from being in Bulgaria and doing amazing things. And you say, I don't have connections. Um, you know, just believe it's amazing things happen. It universe will come together, aligns itself. When you so focused and you're so passionate, every person you meet, you'll tell them what you want to do and they will come together to help you. It'll be amazing the person who helps you, you never thought was a person who could help you. I'd like to ask, what is your attitude and behavior towards uh, risk? Because you're obviously in a, in a risky business, for example, maybe there is a chance that you don't find helium <sighs> free on, on the moon, and still you still go, go for it. And sure. So first of all, no entrepreneur, it, it is a, a myth that entrepreneurs are risk takers. In fact, entrepreneurs are the best de-risker. They hate risks. <laughs> they hate risks. Um, and here's why. When I start a company, I see everything that can go wrong, I think about it. And then I start de-risking everything because I hate risk. And by the way, it's not about helium-3. I have a plan A, plan B, plan C, plan D, plan E, plan F. I mean, that is what um, entrepreneurs do. There is no risk here. What if I just found apps? First of all, we know what's on the moon, so that's a different story. So I'm just giving you an example. But moon is really easy. Right? There is, we know everything that's there because the last 60 years we mapped everything. We know mineralogically what's there. We know everything that's there. But let's assume we didn't know. All I have to do is bring the moon rocks back. Just the moon rocks. And I can still disrupt the whole diamond industry. Here's why. Think about it. Diamonds are neither rare nor they were a symbol of love. De Beers' brilliant marketing campaign in the 50s made it a symbol of love. Moon has been a symbol of love forever. All I have to do is simply make diamond a commodity again. When I bring the moon rocks, I simply say, everyone gives someone a diamond. If you love her enough, you give her the moon. Don't promise her the moon, give her the moon, right? And the girl gets up and says, I'm not gonna marry you for diamond, you're trying to buy me. I thought you loved me, because if you loved me, you'd have given me the moon, <laughs> right? And then honeymoon becomes about taking your honey to the moon, not taking your honey to Paris, because it's honey Paris. <laughs> Uh, so my point is, think of it like that. Rocks can be turned into what you want. <laughs> Actually, uh, next one uh, uh, from Victoria. What causes inequality between uh, women uh, and men in entrepreneurial ecosystem? We understand so, and uh, so, so share. The, yeah. So what I think I see is a lot of women are, to some extent, um, are very good at a lot of great things and they don't take advantage of what they are good at. Instead, they want to be good at because they see the role models as men and they want to emulate the things that men are good at. So they start to talk like them, they start to behave like them and that is what becomes their downfall. Women 
are genetically are very nurturing, caring, and they understand the team building. They understand the people, how to keep the families together. When you start a company, your company is your family. Women are the best at it. They are the best leader. They are the best way to essentially keep the team together, moving in the same direction. But what happens is they look at this world as a man and they say, every successful man is hard charging, is going out and tramp and stepping on everyone's toes, is always aggressive and trying to you know, be. So they start to become like that. They start to dress like men. They start to talk like men. They start to behave like men as opposed to being what they really are good at. So the only reason, and most generally also is, women tend to always be very local because they tend to think of local family, local community, and they tend to do things that are on a smaller basis. As opposed to saying, always think big and global, but test it locally. God forbid if it works, can you scale it? Right, and that is the key is that test locally, but be ready. Don't be in a situation when you do something and it works really, really well. And then you said, huh, I can't do much about it. I can't go global. This is really here. Right? Think on day one. If here's a muffin, how would you go make it a global e-commerce muffin thing? Right? And make it, make it work locally. Uh, Naveen, with tax price, uh, you launched the $1 million, uh, uh, $1 million uh, women's safety uh, fund. Uh, why on women's safety, sure. why do you think women are unsafe in the context of we people sure. being equal and everybody has specificity to contribute to the community? And I think partly it is a cultural uh, in many of the countries and I would say almost every country. You know where the women are most unsafe? United States. In the college campuses, you may not ever hear it, the college campuses, more sexual harassment, more uh, rape, more things happen in the United States in college campuses that you would get to believe. Right? So to us, it wasn't about women's safety. It was simply the foundation that allows, because if you have, don't feel safe, you can't go out and be educated. You cannot be go out and work. And all those things come. You can't have gender equality without having the safety. And all the thing, interesting thing is, it, is a, it's, it becomes is something that detracts from uh, crime happening. So it, you don't have to have, you know, device doesn't have to penetrate. Interesting thing was, there is, very, there is a study done. They had, you know, you know people used to st steal the radio from the cars. And they came up with a mechanism where the plate, you replace the face plate of the radio and it looked identical. But if it was a new type that could trace wherever the radio was automatically. With 1%, with 1 penetration of that, suddenly stop the crime by 30%. And 4% penetration is all it took the crime to stop 100% because nobody knew where, if this one had it or did not have it. So if all, maybe four out of 100 women have the device, other 96 don't, I mean, have to have it. People, somebody's thinking, you say, what if it's being recorded? I'm out of here. <laughs> right? So the thing was that allows the society to change. And once you start with a detraction, slowly the culture starts to change. Right. So the point is then they will see more women in education, they will see more women in healthcare because they feel safe and suddenly the world, the culture changes. Right. So it was something we felt was a foundation of something that needed to be done and necessary evil. It wasn't the destination, it was simply a means to an end. I understand it quite well. Don't you think that this process has started already after the economic crisis in 2008? We see more and more women uh, in C-level roles, uh, also in the leading companies. Uh, yeah. There is lots of effort uh, collectively around the world for supporting and securing this safety net, if you want, for uh, uh, women talent to be exposed. Uh, Honestly, I believe it's being done the wrong way. Women have become the tokens. Every board wants a woman board member, so they bring you on the board because you are a token woman. Mm. Uh, I, they, I tend to disagree with this. Sorry for interrupting Sasha. you because uh, Sasha, I know how you felt. That's why I said yeah, it. Uh, <laughs> no, no. Uh, there is uh, an example from Europe because um, 
Um, actually, Norway was the first country to start uh, with the quotas on women on boards. And uh, because of creating this temporary measure that really was uh, pretty uh, artificial at the beginning, uh, today, 10 years after, uh, you have uh, so many young women, middle-aged women uh, already, uh, that uh, dare to become uh, leaders in the uh, academy, in the business, and so on. So just uh, okay, you interfere a little bit. The culture is uh, not about uh, uh, creating out of this artificial. Yes. So yeah. idea is the culture. Uh, ideally, if you become the best person, nobody should hire you because you are a woman. Nobody should make you a leader because you are a woman. They should make you a leader because you are the best at doing what you do. And the only way you can change the perception, you know how you change the perception? Change the reality. Exactly. Right? So reality changes by you being the best at it. Mm -hmm. And I do not believe in any company today where people are struggling to hire the best talent. They're going to say, oh, I'm not going to hire you because you're a woman. I mean, you can't find people who are good. And, it, you know, <coughs> I would hire a dog if dog could do the job. <laughs> I mean, honestly, my point is, we hire a computer, an AI, to do the job because it can do it. it it's not even a woman. <laughs> right? <laughs> point is, it's not about just we all want the best thing. So be the best. Don't try to think I'm a woman and I need someone to give me the power. I want someone to give me something. Bill, you should be out there and say, I deserve it and I am going to take it. Right? And but let me tell you. I am no different. Look, Sasha, remember, I am an immigrant. I face the same thing as women do. So I know you may think I'm a man, but I'm also come from the minority. Right? In the minority where all the discrimination you think you face as a woman, I face as an immigrant. I remember going to uh, US, I can tell you, a small town, white town in America. <clears throat> they never seen a brown person in their life. It's a town of probably, you know, a couple of hundred people in a French town in the middle of New Jersey. First time they looked at me, they thought the alien has landed. <laughs> and the cop stopped me and gave me three tickets. I was driving and he says, you were driving fast. I said, officer, I wasn't driving fast. He said, you were driving recklessly. And I said, officer, I wasn't driving recklessly. He says, I'm going to issue a warrant. What? Right, because he said, you keep talking, I'm going to keep issuing you tickets. He says, and, and so interesting thing, I couldn't even get the driver's license in that city because they're all white city. I had to go to Trenton where black people live to get the license, right? Point was same discrimination became reversed by Indians becoming so good at what they did. And today, it becomes a reverse discrimination. Every VC, now when you give them a your management team and they can pronounce the name of the, your CTO, they think, you know, they say, you, you have, your team is good except you're weak technically. I can pronounce the name Paul Cook. <laughs> if you say my guy's name is Salvato, something that you cannot pronounce, okay, you got a good technical team, you need to work on your other things, right? So my point is, it becomes by changing the reality is how you change the perception. So all I'm saying is the same problem. Indians do that, Jews did that, we all were prosecuted, we all did that. By d becoming good at one niche. By showing the women can be the best leader, best manager, and using their, their natural skill, is suddenly reverse discrimination will happen. You say, no man can be a good manager. It can only be a woman. So <clears throat> constantly harness. Don't worry about what you're not good at. Don't focus on your weakness, and which is what most people do. They try to improve what they are weak at. No. Harness what you're really good at. So focus on your strength and make it so sharp that you can do that, as opposed to I'm really weak and I can improve on it. That's not going to get you anywhere. Uh, the only point is that eventually we need to accompany and encourage these young women to uh, choose to uh, really... Uh, because you're thinking corporate. 
Ah, what well, corporations well, start your own company? Well, <laughs> Naveen, let me give you a statistic, and uh, which pretty much was a motivation to found uh, the Entrepreneur uh, World Competition uh, that we are doing here uh, four years now. Actually, in a protected environment, in a school, the student companies are 65% of our girls lad. Yeah. In a real uh, life, out of the startups, we only have 12% uh, in Bulgaria, which is uh, best class uh, achievement in the world that are uh, girls led. And these are two, three years of difference in development of these girls. We want all of these 65 people Sasha, I'm just to telling go and to continue. Today, the culture is a problem in the corporates. When corporates thought an Indian cannot be the uh, Indian cannot be a good manager because Indians were never thought to be a good manager because there was no role model for Indians to be good managers, right? What did I do? And I said, screw it. I'm going to go start my own company. And when I started my first company, I didn't know how to run a company. That company went on to become a $35 billion company. Proved that Indians can do it. Today, fifth in the valley, majority, I would say 60% of all the companies that are started, is it started by an immigrant? 60 mm. percent by changing the perception of how it is done by doing when the system would not allow it. Just remember, you most people do they want to rise in the corporate ladder. Why go to the people who don't respect you? You drive them out of business is how they respect you, <laughs> right? So go out there and create a company and say, you know what? You then think I was good enough to work for you. Let me show you how good I am when, you, when you're looking for a job because I'm going to drive you out of business. And when you come looking for a job, I'll tell you how good you are. Right? And that's how you do it. Yeah. Don't let someone tell you what you can do. Yeah, we have a question. Uh, I'm just curious. Oh, yes. Um, hello, my name is Nina. Yes, it's okay. okay. Um, so uh, my question is, just from your personal life, um, First, what is your routine? So we heard about your 4.30 a.m., getting up, reading all that. But also as a father and then as a husband, how do you balance all of that? Okay. So first of all, I'm going to give you two things here. And then I'm going to answer your question. I'm going to make one comment. Never, ever follow the habits of people. Follow their thought process. Yes. So don't worry about what my habits are. You follow every one of my habits, it's not going to get you anywhere. Tony <laughs> Robbins people say, oh, he takes the ice water bath every day. You can take ice water bath five, five times a day, you're still not going to become Tony Robbins. <laughs> right? So the way you become Tony Robbins is by thinking like Tony Robbins. Right? So you're going to become like me by think how I think, not what I do. Right? Now, having said that, <laughs> there is no such thing as balance. Anyone who is trying to draw a balance between a family life and work life is in some sense have already concluded those two things cannot coexist. Balance can only be driven by the things which are completely think are not cannot be lived together. The way you do in life is a life is a continuum. In that continuum of life, there are times there is more of one and there is a time there is more of another. So think of it as in in work. When there is a project that needs you, you focus on that project and then other things take back seat. When your family is in a surgery, that's the most important thing and the work takes a back seat. When the work is in the surgery, <laughs> work needs you and your family takes a back seat. And that's a life. The only other thing I would give you, you know, some little bit of just unasked advice is ups and downs of an entrepreneur. Always think about if your life is you're not seeing ups and downs, you are already dead. Your life of an entrepreneur is like a heartbeat. When there are ups and downs, it tells you you are alive. If you have a smooth line, that means you're already dead. You just don't know it. <laughs> so uh, we have another question from the room from Evelina. Uh, Evelina, I'm an organizational psychologist. I want to go to another area. So in all of the companies that you're building, what do you find is the working organizational culture? What do you find as the most, let's say three things, because I'm pretty sure you can speak about it forever. We heard about passion, so I'm pretty sure that's one, number one ingredient, but what else do you do sure. to build So it? I'm Thank actually, you. passion is not one of them. Not one. No, no. Okay. 
I don't have people when I, I was running Moon Express, everyone thought I was a space. I was so passionate about space. Everybody wanted to know how I got so passionate about space. <laughs> then I started healthcare, and everybody tells me, You're so passionate about healthcare. Can you tell me what got you so passionate about healthcare? Answer is I'm not passionate about healthcare or space. I am passionate about solving the big problems. And how can I go out and solve? help a billion people around the world and because I know if I can help solve the problem of a billion people I know I can create a hundred billion dollar company right so I do it because doing good and doing well are not mutually exclusive they come together the only way to do well is to do good and the only way to do good is to do well <laughs> right so now having said that the things that I find culturally in a company that works really well for me is a complete transparency I, there is nothing that anyone cannot ask or will be answered. Every, even though I'm everywhere, every, I, at least once a day, I have a meeting with my executive team and once a week with a complete company where I tell them what is going on and everyone, I don't care the receptionist or not, everyone gets to ask whatever the question they have on their mind and tell me how we could do something better. And it's encouraged. Nobody ever gets fired because we created a culture where by speaking up, you are rewarded. You're never ever punished. So right. So if somebody says, I feel that my manager is not helping me, that person never gets fired. We make sure that person knows that that is what we want him to say. So tell us where the things we can be better. Mm -hmm. the, the third thing is we want everybody to be the owner in the company. There is never a person in the company that does not do well when we do well. In fact, my first company, my receptionist made multi-million dollars because I wanted everyone to be the owners in the company. So we share the wealth with everyone. That means we take every company that I end up, I'm a minority shareholder when I start because I want to distribute the company to everyone because they feel it is their cause, their company, not my company. And when they, difference between an entrepreneur and a cult leader. When you start a company, all you have is the vision and people fall in love with you and your vision. That is no different than a cult leader. The difference is the cult leader keeps that loyalty to himself. A entrepreneur transfers that loyalty to the purpose and the cause and we become the people for the cause. I may go away as an entrepreneur, the cause doesn't go away and it becomes your cause, your ownership, your thing and I am simply a facilitator who happened to be there. And that is the, if you can create that culture, it suddenly it doesn't matter. I may be here but everyone behind me out there believes their purpose has not changed. Okay, um, I would suggest we stop on uh, this good note yeah. uh, and uh, Naveen, I really want to thank you for being with us and uh, oh, thank spending. You. Can I just say one thing? If you ever have any question, please reach out to me. Uh, I am Naveen Jain at gmail.com. My first name is N-A-V-E-E-N, -E last name is Jain, J-A-I-N. You can put as many dots as you want. Mm -hmm. Gmail ignores it at gmail.com. So naveenjain at gmail.com, please reach out to me. Anything that you did not ask me but wanted to ask me, send me, uh, send me an email. Ask me whatever is on your mind. Just know I'm always at the fingertips for you. I'm in every social media and I'm easily reachable. So don't feel that there is anything. So anytime you're struggling with something, ask me. And I really want to thank you for listening to me. And I hope you guys will go out and do amazing things. How many people here are going to do something, one thing different? <laughs> right. And that really is all I ask for. It's just hope this is not a wasted thing. And I want you to go out and be successful. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we still have 15, 20 minutes uh, um, to make it informal and also to meet yeah. some people that are in sure. the other Absolutely. room. So Thank you. let's maybe grab a coffee and uh, spend some time uh, with Naveen. Mm -hmm.